thank you so much. I am a historian. I love history. I fell in love with history because I've always been surrounded by it. I grew up in a town in New Jersey where George Washington spent two winters during the Revolutionary War. As an undergraduate, I was a tour guide at Harvard, and I used to love telling prospective students about the great fire of 1764 that engulfed the campus and destroyed John Harvard's prized book collection. When I started graduate school at the University of Chicago, history continued to surround me, but this time it was my own history. It was my family's history that met me at every turn. I lived on Chicago's South Side in Hyde Park, which is one of the most historic African-American neighborhoods in the country. So history, once distant in New Jersey and at Harvard, was suddenly getting closer and closer to me. Here was the apartment where my father and my aunt, pictured here as children, lived when they moved to Chicago after migrating from Augusta, Georgia in 1939. Here was Wendell Phillips High School, one of Chicago's first predominantly African-American high schools. This high school was a source of pride and an anchor in the black community. This was also where my parents met and went to their prom together. Carl Sandburg famously described Chicago as the hog butcher for the world and the city of big shoulders. But to me, Chicago was a place where my family's history came to life. Now, there was one story that my aunt shared with me about my family's history that was so compelling but also so tragic that I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it was the story of a distant cousin of ours who had grown up on Chicago's South Side. She lived a life like any other black child of her time. She went to Wendell Phillips High School, and she cheered as the historic Bud Billiken Parade made its way through Washington Park. But her life would take a dramatically different turn when she graduated from high school. My cousin was very light-skinned. She looked white. And her mother had decided that, that it was in her best interest to leave the south side of Chicago and move far away to Los Angeles and pass as a white woman. Now, my cousin did not want to do this. She pleaded with her mother. She did not want to leave her family and her friends and the only life that she had ever known. But her mother was insistent, and the matter was decided. So years later, after my cousin had married a white man and raised white children who knew nothing of their mother's past, she received a very inconvenient phone call. It was her mother, and she was calling to tell her that her father was dying and that she must come home immediately. Despite these dire circumstances, my cousin would never return to Chicago's South Side. She was a white woman now, and there was simply no turning back. Now, this is all that my family knows about this story, so we can only imagine how her life unfolded. We can only imagine how she must have felt knowing that her father was dying and that she would never see him again. This had to have been a heartbreaking loss, but this was not even the only loss that she would experience. Once she passed as white, she was gone from the black community. She would never go to another Bud Billiken parade. She would never smell the hot dogs that were sold at the parade. She would never hear the sounds of the marching bands as they made their way through the park. And she would never have the joy of sharing this experience with her own children. So this story really stayed with me, and I, I've, I've been wrestling with it ever since my aunt shared it with me. And as a historian and as a scholar, I've always kept history at arm's length. That's what we're trained to do. But I couldn't be dispassionate about this story. I knew that as a historian I was supposed to be objective, but I couldn't, I couldn't let this story go. It wouldn't let me go. 
So I decided to write a history of racial passing. Now, conventional wisdom says that you can't write a history of racial passing, that there's no records, because the people who passed were so careful to make sure that there was no trace of their transgression, that they were careful to make sure that they couldn't be found. But I believed that the sources were out there, and I believed that they were waiting for a historian to discover. So I went out looking for ghosts. I went into the archives looking for ghosts in the hopes that I could tell their story. And what I found was that writing a history of passing is writing a history of loss. Now, this doesn't quite make sense, because it seems that to pass as white was to gain. To be white, particularly during the period of racial segregation, meant to have a better job. It meant to live in a better neighborhood. It meant the right to vote. It meant to enjoy countless social privileges, everything from sitting at a better table in a restaurant or enjoying a more comfortable seat at a movie theater. But what struck me was not so much what was gained by passing, but rather what was lost by leaving an African-American identity behind. So let me share one story with you from my research that I think elucidates this idea of loss. And this is a story of a woman named Elsie Roxborough. Elsie Roxborough was born into a storied African-American family. But she chose to pass as white in 1937 after she graduated from the University of Michigan. Her story ends in tragedy. She took her own life in 1949. The Roxborough family lived a life during the Great Depression that few Americans could imagine. Elsie rode horses and drove her father's cars. The family had maids and chauffeurs, and they vacationed with other black elites at Idlewild, a prestigious resort nicknamed the Black Eden. One family member said, we knew times were hard out there. We knew that there were people who were selling apples on the street corners, but not our crowd. We wore white linen jackets to Sunday school. When Elsie arrived at the University of Michigan in 1933, she would become the first black woman to live in a dorm. Elsie's friends described her as driven and ambitious. Elsie had a beauty that few men, black or white, could resist. She was tall and slender, glamorous and vivacious. The poet and novelist Langston Hughes admired her. Her classmate and the future playwright Arthur Miller called her a beauty, the classiest girl in Ann Arbor. Langston Hughes wrote that Elsie used to tell him her dreams, and she used to wonder if maybe if she passed as white, she might be able to achieve them more easily. Elsie did decide to pass. First, she moved to California, and then she moved to New York. And once she arrived in New York, she dropped the famous Roxborough name and became the unattached white Mona Manet. But even as a white woman, her dreams would not come true. When Elsie's white roommate returned from a weekend trip, she found Elsie in her bed. It appeared that she had committed suicide. Elsie's sister could also pass as white, so she traveled to New York with the wrenching assignment of claiming the body. The arrival of this ostensibly white sister allowed Elsie to remain white even in death. Elsie had asked her father for financial help, and he refused her. And three days later, she was dead. Elsie's sister would never talk to her father again. I never expected to see myself in my research. I did not choose a different racial identity, but I have walked through a lot of loss in my life. As I was writing this book, I lost my marriage, and the life that I had dreamed for myself. I also lost 
so many loved ones who I cared about so deeply, including two cousins who were like sisters to me, and my dear aunt, the magnificent storyteller who had connected me so closely to my own family history, and who had also told me the story of my cousin that would set my project on passing into motion. And for the last 13 years, I have carried with me the loss of my sister, who died of breast cancer at the age of 31. Writing this book has been a profoundly painful and also emotional journey. But perhaps it was my own experience with loss that helped me to see and to feel so keenly what the subjects in my book felt. As I was writing about Elsie Roxborough, I began to realize just how universal the experience of loss is. Now certainly, those people who passed as white experienced a very specific kind of loss, a severing of family relationships and a wondering of what could have been. At some point in each of our lives, we all must walk away from something that we hold dear. And when all that's left are the memories and the fragments, we all wonder what could have been. At some point in each of our lives, we all reach out for someone or for something that is no longer there. Divorce and death are perhaps two of losses most painful iterations, but we all experience many forms of loss. There's the loss of moving away from home and knowing that you're never going back, or moving away from home and knowing that even if you did go back, it would never be quite the same. So this is why I fell in love with history, because no matter how far we look back, we can always find a history that is so very close to our own. No matter how far we look, we can always find an image of ourselves. And isn't that the beauty of history? For once we realize just how common and just how universal the experience of loss is, doesn't that make it so much easier to bear? Thank you very much. Thank you.